Let's take a look at today's papers. Now, many of the front pages are featuring some shocking figures on anti-Semitism published by the charity the Community Security Trust. The Times reports that Hamas attacks on Israel and their aftermath has driven anti-Semitism in Britain to its highest level in more than 40 years. Yes, Daily Mail also leading on the rise in anti-Semitism. It says that for the first time there was at least one anti-Semitic incident recorded for every police force in the UK. The majority, more than 2,400, in London. The Guardian's reporting that Sir Keir Starmer is facing a fresh test of his authority as MPs prepare to vote on a second parliamentary motion calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. A similar vote in November triggered 10 front bench resignations. Front page of Telegraph quotes campaigner actress Sophie Winkleman, who says school children should be given brick phones instead of smartphones to protect them from the junk of social media. <clears throat> the daughter-in-law of the Prince and Princess Michael of Kent called on the government to get behind a campaign to ban smartphones for under-16s. And take a look at this. Uh, Queen Camilla, and not one, but 12 Danes. Last night, the Queen attended an event celebrating the works of Shakespeare and was joined by a host of actors, including Dame Judi Dench, Dame Twiggy Lawson and Dame Vanessa Redgrave. The host, Giles Brandreth, Gave her two matching jumpers. He does like a jumper, doesn't he, Charles? Mm, he does. Um, with a heart on them as a Valentine's Day gift, saying he hoped they would keep the king and queen warm on cold winter nights. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you somewhere, OK? I'm going to take you to um, Hendersonville in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take you to an aquarium and shark lab. I'm going to take you to a tank, OK? In the tank is Charlotte. Charlotte is a stingray. Now, Charlotte's lived a fairly uneventful life, according to the scientists that look after her. Um, she's a rust-coloured fish, but she is now at the centre of a once-in-a-lifetime mystery. Hooked? Peaked? Interest no. peaked? OK. So, she hasn't come into any contact with males of her species for eight years. In captivity. This is always in captivity. She's in captivity in a tank, right? Charlotte's pregnant. She's expected to give birth to pups in a fortnight. Hence the mystery. So she's had no contact with a male stingray, yet she's pregnant. So, there are a couple of theories around. The first is that she could have produced asexually, OK? And this is a process known as parthenogenesis. And it's been seen in other sharks, skates and rays before. But there's also an alternative theory, because the staff there have been observing Charlotte. And over recent times, they've noticed some bite marks on her. And there was um, a young shark in the tank. And they thought the other fish were nipping at her and these were the bite marks. But then they clicked and thought, this male, young male shark, when they mate, they right. bite. They bite. So there's the theory that there could be a cross species created, but the only way they're going to find out, mind you... Is when she gives birth. Exactly. Professor Steve Simpson, who's a marine biologist at the University of Bristol, because lots of marine biologists have been spoken to about this, he said a stingray-shark relationship would be the equivalent to a human mating with a camel. Okay. So uh, if you put that kind of out there, it's very unlikely. Mm. But they are anticipating the birth of these pups and they're going to take a look. Seahorses uh, are, are both sexes, aren't they? Well, isn't it isn't that, that right? the males carry the eggs? Isn't and, it the females uh, produce the eggs and the males carry the eggs and give birth to the eggs? And worms. Is that the other one? I'll just make that up. We did have a conversation this morning about it. I think there was... Um, worms? Alligators as well might be able to asexually produce. 6.21 is time now. There you go, now you know. Uh, the amount sheep farmers are being paid for full... Wool fleeces has been in steady decline since the 50s. Most now receive less than 26 pence per kilogram from British wool. Farmers in Lincolnshire have resorted to burning their fleeces in protest and say the measly payments simply aren't worth their time and transport costs. Our reporter Lindsay Smith explains. This is British wool burning on Jade Betts' Lincolnshire farm a protest at the price she and other farmers are paid for the fleeces from their sheep. Sadly, this is where we burn our wool, from our beloved sheep, and that's the sad situation that we're in. We burn the wool because it is not viable for us to 
try and send it to the wool board, which is quite a distance from us, the rigmarole that you have to go through to get it to them, and then for the small, measly cheque that you would get from them afterwards. It's not worth it. With 260 sheep, this would be classed as a small farm. It would cost around three pounds per sheep to be sheared, around 30 pence per fleece to transport it to market. And Jade said after that, they could expect to check for about 30 pounds for their wool. At Rand Farm Park, <laughs> lambs are the main attraction. All last year's wool is piled up. It costs us around three pounds uh, per head to shear a sheep. Um, we get roughly for each fleece one pounds fifty, uh, and we worked out transportation per fleece would cost about thirty p each. Financially, we're losing, but we shear our sheep as an event for our visitors, so we get that side from it as well. Thousands of UK farmers still send their fleeces to British wool depots, but others across the country, like Jade, are burning or burying it. Karen Hames couldn't bear such waste. So here it is. Yes, 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 all in its glory. She's had tweed woven from her flock and believes persuading fashion designers to visit farms Come on. could be the answer. Could rival the Scottish trade, you know, who knows? <laughs> fashion designers need to come and look at what farmers, what fleece they've got, what they can do with it. And that, for me, would be, that would be the icing on the cake. British Wool says there'll always be a gulf between the pennies farmers are paid and retail prices. Take the raw fleece from the sheep to get it into an end product has to go through a number of different stages. And all of those stages cost money. It ends up in the retail market and the retailer needs to make the money they need to make. It's not like synthetics. Synthetics are very, very straightforward to make and that's why they're so cheap. Despite expected price rises, some tell us they simply won't give their products for others to profit. So expect more fleece fires soon. Lindsay Smith, BBC News.